A murder so brutal, it is beyond imagination. There were stab marks to the face. The body was just badly charred. It's beyond uh, explanation. People that torture other human beings are different kind of people. The ruthless killer at large for decades. It seemed like a nightmare. We just didn't know who did it. Spurred on by a mother's anguish, a tenacious detective discovers the key to the crime. All the hair on your whole body stands on end. That dude's evil. But can she bring him to justice before he kills again? He says to her, let the torture begin. I was scared to death. A 45-minute drive from Los Angeles, California, lies the Oceanside community of Sunset Beach. Three things make a remark. That large stretch of sand, the wind is always blowing, and the sunsets are remarkable. For the laid-back residents of Sunset Beach, October 24, 1988 is just another picture-perfect day until someone notices smoke billowing from an apartment building near the main drag. Then it became a, a lot thicker smoke, and he ran over there and called 911. The fire department was very close by. They were there in a hurry. And then they extinguished the fire from outside, and then when it was safe, they made entry into the apartment and to put out the rest of the fire. When they did that, they observed the remains of a charred human being lying on a bed. Horrified, firefighters quickly contact police. We were in our vehicle when we received a page from our supervisor of the Homicide Bureau. The seasoned investigator is surprised by what awaits him as Carney and his forensic team carefully make entry into the apartment. There is a very visceral reaction when you go into a, a homicide scene where there's been an arson. There's the smell, the burnt petroleum products, like from the rug, the carpets, or furniture. And things are melted, and things are destroyed, and things that you would, would normally recognize as clothing might just be a pile of rubble. Making doubly difficult the task of determining what happened here because everything's black and charred and sort of a mess, and you have to look at it a little more carefully or differently. It isn't long before investigators catch sight of their victim. Looking into the bedroom from the hallway, you could see it was uh, completely burnt out, and what appears to be a human being laying on the bed. He was laying crosswise, and the legs from the knees down were hanging off the bed. The body was just badly charred. I mean, just totally, it's beyond uh, explanation. More horrifying still. Looks like a pillow was placed over his face. We didn't see all the damage initially, but once we took the pillow off, then we could see that he was slashed around his neck. The victim had clearly been murdered. Then the apartment set ablaze. A well-planned murderer who doesn't want to get caught would try to cover up a crime scene or destroy it. A closer examination of the body reveals the victim had been stabbed more than 18 times. This was not like self-defense. It was uh, an act of anger. Who was the vicious killer? And what's their connection to the unidentifiable victim? Investigators hope the blood at the scene will provide some answers. When you have stabbing crimes, Obviously, there's going to be blood. And if there's a lot of stabbing, then a lot of blood is shed. And blood's very slippery. Your hand is probably perspiring. And if you don't have a good, solid grip, the blade used will turn in your hand and cut yourself. Leaving blood from the murderer behind. The carnage in the area of the bed makes it virtually impossible to identify what blood, if any, belongs to the killer. But what about the rest of the room? 
Hirose finds a blood-stained towel in the sink in the ensuite bathroom and bags it for analysis, then moves on to the kitchen. Well, there wasn't as much fire damage in the kitchen, so it was easier to see the blood. And you could see a little bit on the cabinetry and then also on the floor. Have the investigators found what could be a key piece of evidence? Blood left by the killer. It was blood that had fallen with some slight velocity, which tells me someone cut themselves and went to the sink in the kitchen to wash themselves or to put something on it. It didn't seem like it would be the victim, because with all of his slashes around the neck and stab wounds in the body, it would seem more likely that it was somebody else. Hirose carefully collects the samples. If uh, some of the blood that was more of a smear, then I'd have to use a swab in order to collect them. There's no doubt in my mind that that was going to be the suspect's blood. But how will investigators determine the identity of his prey? Well, the victims are usually identified through the fingerprints. But because this victim was burned so badly, the hands were not in a condition where fingerprints could be taken. Eventually, we would have to go to the family and find out where he got his dental work done and compared to the corpse. The detectives are deeply concerned by what they learn. There was a possibility that the victim was killed during a drug transaction, gone wrong. Investigators are on the gruesome scene of what appears to be a homicide-related arson in Sunset Beach, California. Now based on paperwork found in a room undamaged by the fire, police believe the murdered man is a resident of the apartment. Dental records confirm it. They able to positively identify uh, the victim as being Robert Hogan. A popular 29-year-old surfer. He was a, a happy-go-lucky guy. He smiled a lot. Everybody that you talk about Rob or Robbie said he's a nice guy. Injured in a bicycle accident, Robert Haugen got by on unemployment and disability insurance. But his close friend David McEwen recalls Robert was always the life of the party. He had a magnetic personality. He drew people to him. I don't think that there's a person that knew him who could say a bad thing about Robert. I really don't. I know I couldn't. And as long as I knew him, I, I, I don't think I ever got mad at him, ever. But someone did. Now it's up to investigators to find out who. We're looking for any evidence that would indicate a motive or anything that would indicate a possible suspect. They take note of what might be an important clue. There didn't appear to be any signs of force entry, such as pry marks or forcing of the door. Had Haugen willingly opened the door to his attacker, or did the killer have a key? Through the evidence, we had learned that the apartment was co-occupied by a female. Could this roommate have had a hand in Robert's grisly murder? In cases like this, everybody's a suspect. And then we go through a systematic approach of eliminating them through interviews. The roommate maintained she was at work when the victim was killed, an alibi corroborated by her co-workers. What about McCune? Could he have been involved? They said, I have to ask you this question. Did you kill Robert? I said, are you kidding me? I loved Robert, you know. He was like a brother to me. Every day we talked to each other. Either he'd ride up to my house or I'd go down there, go to the beach. And he called me that day and wanted me to come down and hang out with him, and I couldn't make it. And to this day, I always tell my wife, you know what? Had I been there, maybe there would have been a different turnout. It haunts me from time to time, it really does. And that's not all that haunts him. A few days after Robert's murder, David McCune paid a visit to the burnt out apartment in the hope of finding some closure. You could still see a lot of the splatters of the blood across the walls and the ceiling, and you could tell it was a very violent, violent scene there. And I was just thinking, man, how could somebody do this to Robert? But there was more to Robert Haugen than meets the eye. Based on the evidence that we found in the house, a weighing device used to weigh quantities for drug sales. 
there was a possibility that Robert was killed during a drug transaction gone wrong. Investigators pour over what little evidence they do have from the scene. We went through his address book that was badly charred and burnt, but partially readable. And see who he was talking to and calling, and we talked to those people as well. We even, you know, went door to door and asked his neighbors, did you hear anything? What time were you home? You know, did you guys see Robert? What time was he here? You know, was he with anybody? And, you know, and it's probably the same stuff that the police ask him. We were nobody special. We just wanted to find out what happened to our friend. But no one offers up anything that might help solve the case. In the months following, Tim Carney continues to plug away at the investigation. Let's redo this interview. Let's talk to this person again. And what are we missing? And the pressure to solve the case continues to grow. The mother came to Orange County to meet with me uh, on the case. And she was a very, very sweet, loving woman. His mom was a wonderful person. And it, this just, just broke her heart, just broke her heart. I didn't have much to offer. We had done everything that we possibly could do at that point in time. You know, after a while, for even for a police officer, you got to say, you know what? We have no leads. It's over. Enough's enough. Yeah, it's the unchecked box. It's always with you. You never forget them. More than a decade goes by. But the passage of time does little to diminish a mother's need for justice. So every October on Robert's birthday, she'd call and say, I don't want my son's murder to be forgotten. And every year, she'd maybe talk to somebody else in the investigation unit. Then, in 2001, it was Sergeant Yvonne Scholl's turn to take the mother's call. I talked to her for probably 15 minutes that day. And when I got off the phone, I felt, wow, something needs to be done with this, because here's a mother who is in agony. Scholl pulls the case files and begins to review the evidence. My first thought when looking at the crime scene photos is, wow, somebody was really, really mad at him. The number of stabs and to start his apartment on fire to destroy evidence. The brutal details of the crime seem eerily familiar to show. I knew that there was a double murder in the same area about four years prior to Robert's murder that was involved with drugs. In that case, the bodies of a 25-year-old surfer and his girlfriend were found bound and gagged and in a pool of their own blood. Not only had they lived just doors away from Robert. Crimes happen in broad daylight, drug dealers killing their house, you know, on the same street, stabbed many times. Was there a serial killer on the loose in Surf City? He is a very sadistic, violent, and evil person. But we don't know who you are. You're a ghost to me right now. In her effort to solve the gruesome murder of Robert Haugen, Sergeant Yvonne Schull is comparing the case to that of a double homicide four years prior. Could we have a serial killer in the area of Sunset Beach? You just can't imagine that it happens so close. And when it does, you know, you have a lot of rage and anger in you, and you want, really want to find out who did it. Determining the answer is a slow and painstaking process. First, you look at the victims. Do they know each other? Can I connect them in any way? The second thing that I did is look at all of their friends. Is there a friend connection? A quest for answers that doesn't stop at the end of the day. When you go home at night, you're thinking about that address book. Your spreadsheet that you made is in your briefcase because you're flipping through it on the coffee table, seeing if something will pop out to you. But months later. I could never find a connecting line between the two cases. And that's frustrating to work all that time and look at the cases and look at the people, but never find something that links them together. 
not prepared to give up, Shaw attempts to connect the case to crimes committed elsewhere in the United States using the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. So I filled out the 44-page case submission booklet and sent it to the FBI in hopes that I could have something match up. Got nothing. No other matches, no other anything in the country that I could pursue. And the sergeant is dreading what's to come. A year had gone by, and Robert Haugen's mother had called me again on Robert's birthday. I mean, it's, it was heartbreaking to talk to her, because she would cry on the phone, and she kept telling me, I think my son is just going to be a statistic. You're trying to maintain your rough, tough investigator composure and tell her to keep the faith. And this time, Yvonne Schull makes a promise she may come to regret. I promise I won't forget, and I will solve this case. With the weight of those words heavy on her shoulders, Schull revisits the Haugen file yet again. So I go through the photographs, I meet with the forensic scientists and say, what can we do? And they tell me, well, we think that we can do some DNA testing. We think that we maybe can get a DNA profile. A profile they hope will lead them to their killer. But 14 years after the murder took place, that's far from certain. You're never sure if you can get DNA because you don't know if the sample's large enough. You don't know if it was collected properly because in 1988, DNA was not on the forefront of science. You basically have your fingers crossed that we have a big enough sample to get something now. In these arson cases, there's just so much that's going on. It's very chaotic, and there's a lot of visual overload. Sometimes you don't get everything, and you can't collect every single drop of blood from a crime scene. The mistakes we make the day of the crime can come back and haunt us in the future and really impact the case in a negative way. To Shull's relief, the sample is sufficient to provide the murderer's DNA. But to her disappointment... I get back that there is what's called a forensic unknown. We have a profile, however, we have no match to it. That means that somebody out there is a murderer, but we don't know who you are. You're a ghost to me right now. A ghost that continues to trouble her long after she moves to another department within the Orange County Police Force. I took the case with me because I couldn't forget it. At that point, I felt that I knew Robert. Yes, I knew that he smoked marijuana, and yes, I knew he sold marijuana, but it didn't matter to me because everyone that I talked to about Robert told me what a nice, nice man he was and that he would give you the shirt off his back. He did not deserve what happened to him. And his fate made worse by the fact his killer walks free. I'm feeling at this point that it's not going to be solved. I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to call Robert's mother and say, I know who did it. And I'm very frustrated at that point. You wake up every day, and, and it was the same thing. No news, no suspects. We're looking at this person. We're looking at that person. We're talking to this guy. It just seemed like it took forever and ever, and there was just nothing. In April 2004, Yvonne Schull returns to the Orange County Homicide Unit. Robert Haugen's case returns with her. And I continued to look at stuff, continued to talk to the forensic scientists, and we're still pretty much nowhere on the case. But what they do, and they, what they did in this case, is they call it a murder book. They open up the murder book and say, is there anything new in here? Is there anything we forgot? They show it to a new set of detectives. Because I know that it doesn't matter who you are, you don't see everything. And sometimes you just need a fresh set of eyes to look at something. Shull brings on board Sergeant Ray, who, having received death threats during the course of the investigation, continues to fear for his life. It was very difficult because Robert seemed to be such a nice person who had no enemies. And then to look at those crime scene photos and to see the viciousness of this homicide, those two characteristics of this case just did not mix. He's starting to get to know Robert. He's pulling 
yearbooks from when Robert went to school and looking at people who may be able to provide us with just a speck of something to go forward with. Meanwhile, both officers harbor a growing sense that the killer is someone close to home. If you read books on unsolved murders or you go to classes on unsolved murders, all of them say, go over the case again, go over the case again. The person who did it's name is in the case. You just haven't found it. Sergeant Ray narrows the names down to just one, the woman with whom Robert shared the apartment. Because it was a male-female roommate situation, was there a jealous boyfriend? The sergeant questions her once again. The interview of the roommate was almost identical to the information she had given the original investigators. And to me, that is big because making up a story is a lot harder than telling the truth. Ray and I talk again, what can we do now? And he said, you know, I think we should put the evidence back in to be re-examined because there's a new DNA system called Profiler Plus. Perfect, let's do it. So he submits the evidence for re-examination. But will it find a match? I was sitting in my office and Ray came to the door and said, I just got this from forensics and I am on the edge of my seat. Tell me what you got. Hoping to determine the identity of Robert Haugen's killer, investigators have requested more advanced testing on the blood drops found in Haugen's apartment 19 years earlier. And when I found a complete profile that did not match the victim, that's where I felt, OK, now I have something that I can put into the database and see if there's a hit. And it began searching for DNA profiles to see if there's a match. Because Robert's murder was so violent, I'm optimistic that this person has not stopped their criminal ways. And they have been caught, and their DNA has been taken, uploaded into the nationwide database. So we try, and we strike out again. And there are hundreds if not thousands of cases on books of, with that exact circumstance. All they're waiting for is for that one person to make a mistake and get arrested and have their DNA entered in the national database. It's just a total waiting game. And sometimes it could take just a few months or it could take years or decades more. And that's sometimes the frustrating part of it. Eventually, uh, I had moved away and just kind of put it behind me. But we would try to go to the beach in October, and we'd throw flowers or a wreath of flowers in. I don't know, it was just like a, like I remember you, brother, you know? I, I'm still here and I remember you, you know? It is a sentiment all too familiar to senior deputy district attorney, Brahim Baytek. Victims' families never forget about cases because they never forget about their lost loved ones. The investigators in this case never forgot about the case. Three long years later, in January of 2009. I was sitting in my office, and Ray came to the door and said, I just got this from forensics, and I am on the edge of my seat. Tell me what you got. And he said, we got a hit. That match was out of the state of Nevada. So our forensic unknown is identified. Who is it? He says, well, it's Paul Smith. And I go, who's Paul Smith? I had to go back over these case books to try to find that name somewhere. And I didn't find it anywhere. From our perspective, Paul Smith did not exist. We did not know about him. He was never interviewed in 1988. He was never even on the radar. Maybe it's one of those things where if you don't ask the question, you won't get the answer. Once we asked the question, people said, oh, yeah. Paul Smith used to buy marijuana from Robert Haugen. OK. In fact, Paul and Robert had attended this Long Beach High School together. We discovered Paul Smith was a standout varsity wrestler in high school, had received a, a scholarship for Biola University, which is a Christian university. At the time of the murder, Paul Smith was working for a Bible translation company. It's hardly the profile of a cold-blooded killer. He was 
basically living a, a very normal, average, middle-class type job with the house with the white picket fence, two kids, and, and a dog. I knew him very well, you know. I knew his brother and his family. You know, we were a close-knit group. But having divorced his wife, Paul Smith is living in Las Vegas. And in 2007, he assaults his girlfriend, Tina Smith. The police come and they arrest him. I eventually pleads guilty to domestic violence. Part of that scenario, he's required to give a sample of his DNA. The sample that proved a match to the drops of blood found in Robert Haugen's apartment. I wanted to get in the car and drive out there right then and there. But being an investigator, you know you can't just do that. We know that we only have one chance to find out from Paul Smith as to why his blood might be in the apartment. It may not have anything to do with the murder. He may just have his blood there. We don't know why. We start doing a background check on him, and we find out about the 2007 incident involving Tina Smith. And to me, that was very interesting. Their research reveals Smith to be a sadist with a violent history of torturing his girlfriend. She was drawn to him like a moth to a flame. He not only had stabbed her, he had pointed a loaded gun at her and actually discharged the gun, nearly striking her as she was tied up on a bed. But it's an incident eerily similar to Robert Haugen's murder that captures the attention of investigators. He was angry at her, started using a knife on her. He beat her up, doused her in lighter food, and threatened to set her on fire. But the clicker that he was using to set her on fire, click, 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 wouldn't work. That dude's evil. People that torture other human beings are different kind of people. The notion of wanting to be sadistic, that's different. That tells you this person belongs in a completely different category of perpetrators. It became like, I can see how torture plays a factor into what happened to Robert Haugen. The crime in our homicide case and the crime against his girlfriend were very violent, involved stabbing, involved a bed. And that made us realize this is a serious suspect that we have here. Cold cases are like giving CPR to an elephant. And you work, and you work, and you work, and you work, and sometimes it never works. And sometimes, at a moment's notice, the elephant is going to jump up and start stampeding because you have breathed life into it. And in February of 2009, Sergeant Ray finally travels to Nevada to interview Paul Smith. We want to try to lock him into a story. Do you have an explanation for why your blood is there? And then, come on, I know you did it. I know you want to tell me. Just get it off your chest. What happened in there? Then why did you get hurt? Sergeant Ray is en route to Las Vegas to meet Paul Smith, the man police believe is Robert Haugen's murderer. We get into the Clark County Jail. When Paul comes into that room, he is extremely nervous, and he is shaking, and he is visibly disturbed. He was a suspect in our mind. However, we wanted to make sure that we are on the right track. You know, we, we're human beings. Everybody makes mistakes. He said, you're not in trouble, and this is a voluntary thing. We're asking for your help, if you can. We wanted to make him feel comfortable, make him think that this is, to some degree, a routine. We just want to talk to you, see if you can point us in the right direction. Hopefully, there's a tidbit of information that you can give us that you may or may not be able to help us out. Paul Smith seemed eventually kind of eager to talk about how great of a person Robert was. Any enemies you could think of that, you know, would do this? No, no, everybody loved him. Paul Smith even told us that he attended Robert's funeral. Yeah, I spoke to him. You did? Was his family there and all that? Oh, yeah. It was at one of those moments that, like, all the hair on your whole body stands on end, and you're like, I can't believe it. Smith admits to buying marijuana from Robert. But, but for a long time. He was the biggest dealer around. And how often would you go to his house and buy? Regularly. Once a week, twice a week. Yeah, once a week. Can you do me a favor? Can you do a diagram of maybe just starting the front door and, and 
there. And Paul Smith drew us an accurate diagram of that apartment. So it was apparent to us that Paul Smith knew this apartment and he knew our victim. The day that he died, did you talk to him at all? No. Oh, yeah, I did. Yes, I did. And I told him to save him another bag. Smith says that he planned to pick up that bag of marijuana the day of Robert's murder, but there was a snag. I called him and his phone was out of order. What time did you call him when it was out of order, do you remember? Uh, one. When he said one o'clock, it was huge because that was the exact time that witnesses pinpointed when the fire was seen. In an effort to draw out the real story, the sergeant digs deeper. Ever see anyone get in an argument or a fight with him at the apartment? No. That was why it was a shock to everybody, pretty much. That he was such a nice guy. And and you and Robert got along. You guys never had any problems. No. And we decided it was time to begin asking Paul Smith about the blood. Why we found his blood in the apartment. There is an innocent explanation. We want to hear it. We want to give him a chance to tell us, hey, look, man, I have nothing to do with it. And Paul Smith said, you didn't find my blood in there. I, I never bled in that apartment. Sergeant Ray figures it's time to set him straight. That's your specimen number, and that's the match. This is science, man. I mean, it doesn't get any more conclusive than DNA. You know about DNA. After Paul looked at that DNA report, he took a few moments and he seemed to be thinking about it. And then he decided to tell us, oh yeah, I remember now, there was that time. I cut my finger right here with a knife the day before playing with it. It's possible. However, why didn't you just tell me that in the beginning? I guess maybe it's just our suspicious nature. We don't believe a word that he said. We believe that he cut himself. We believe he cut himself while he was murdering Robert. I believe something happened between you and Robert. There was some sort of a fight that you guys had. There had to have been a reason for it. Never had a fight with Robert ever. The sergeant decides to cut to the chase. What happened, Paul? I know you want to tell me, OK? Just get it off your chest. What happened in there? Nothing. Then why did you hurt him? I never hurt him. Despite Sergeant Ray's best efforts, Paul Smith is unwavering. Even though he didn't break, we were able to get a lot of information from him that was very helpful to us. The prosecutor in Orange County decides that there is enough evidence to charge Paul Smith with murder. I can tell you, for me personally, that was the first time that I filed a case from 20 years ago. Because I think sometimes perpetrators after a year or two they think they got away with it but when you're talking about 20 years they really thought they got away with it they really think i did it nobody knows that i did it they don't have the evidence to come after me and i'm going to move on once we served the arrest warrant on the jail in las vegas i told ray let me call robert's mom it took me all day to psych myself up to do it and i said hello it's yvonne Scholl from the sheriff's department are you sitting down? Today is the day I know who murdered your son, and he's under arrest. And I, again, had my rough, tough investigator persona on so I could not cry. But as soon as Shell gets home. I called my mom to tell her what I did for the day. Then I cried. She said, I knew you could do it. In March of 2009, Paul Smith is extradited from Nevada, and Sergeant Ray has the satisfaction of escorting him back to California to face charges. I can imagine, on one hand, it's rewarding. You know, I, this guy thought he got away with murder, and I'm bringing him back. On another hand, you're in the same car with somebody that you know is an evildoer. He didn't really have a whole lot to say. I think by that time, he realized that he wasn't able to fool the cops. He's in Orange County Jail held without bail on a, what we call it, a special circumstances murder charge. Can't get out. Knowing that his mind is spinning right now, and we're interested to see what he's going to do next as far as reaching out to people.
The answer is nothing short of shocking. Hearing that Paul Smith wants me uh, killed was obviously unnerving. To be the person to have put him in that position, I was scared to death. Murder suspect Paul Smith is cooling his heels in a California prison, but the case against him is far from complete. And even after Paul Smith was brought back to Orange County, I continued to do a lot of interviews, including Paul Smith's girlfriend, Tina Smith. And I think that's when Paul Smith went into mode of, I got to make sure people don't tell the police about what I've done, mostly to Tina Smith. When we realized that, we started monitoring all of his correspondence from the jail. We started taping all of his phone calls. I just got a call from a detective if they want to interview me about something you may have been involved in 25 years ago. Oh, with me? Yes. 25 years ago? He says they're investigating a cold case. And I'm the suspect? Something you might have been involved with, I guess. I don't know, babe. I have no idea. His brain is going, you know, 1,700 miles an hour, trying to figure out what can I do to get out of what I did. And I suspect one of the first things that his attorney told him is the DA didn't just file murder charges against you. The DA filed murder charges with a special circumstance of torture because every single stab, every single one of those 18 stabs, Robert Haugen was alive which means in California, he's potentially eligible for the death penalty. Within a matter of weeks. We start to hear rumors from a jailhouse informant that Paul Smith is asking around, can you introduce me to somebody who can do my dirty work? He wants to have certain people he has identified to be assaulted or killed. Sergeant Ray is one of them. He was very, very upset with Ray. Very, very upset with Ray. And because he's a sociopath and he's selfish, it's never his fault for anything. It's always somebody else's fault. So Paul Smith goes into this, I need to do whatever I can to get rid of Ray. Well, you know, there's over 40 murderers in here, right? Yeah. Well, it turns out I was talking with a few of them. A couple of them are from Orange County. Really? Yeah, and they said they know some people that if charges are filed against me, that they'll go pay somebody a visit and let that person know how much I appreciate them and send a special gift to them, thanking them. Hearing that Paul Smith wants me killed was obviously unnerving. To be the person to have put him in that position, I, I was scared to death. Smith's other target? He's trying to get rid of someone who we're going to bring to court as a witness who will testify against him and say that he committed the crime. If we have no witnesses, we have no case. We wanted to make sure that everything that Paul Smith is doing while he's in custody, we know about it, and hopefully we know about it before he does it. Investigators have their jailhouse informant put Smith in touch with Blade, an undercover officer posing as a hitman. So he's talking to Blade, and he's talking to him about, you know, I want to take out Ray. And the concern that I, I have at that moment is, I have control over what he's telling Blade. But what I was worried about is, what if he talks to another inmate at the jail who's willing to help him, who's not going to come and tell us? So we needed to move fast. But the arrangements for the hit on Sergeant Ray are already well underway. Somebody will be contacting you, baby, OK? And then you'll need to go to my bank and withdraw all the rest of the money from my account, OK? OK. All right, because it's not going to do me any good in jail. I'd rather spread the wealth around and the happiness. Okay. Unbelievable. He stabbed her, shot at her, and beat her up and all these things. And she's still doing whatever he wants her to do. Tina Smith's first task is to make certain that Blade, who she too believes to be a real hitman, has the right cop in his sights. She's been interviewed by Ray, so she knows who he is. And so she meets with the undercover operative. The operative says, I'll get you pictures so that we can confirm that this is the person that you want hurt. Then, despite Shull's growing unease. Unfortunately, I have to sit Ray down and say, hey, although your life is in danger, I need you to have some photographs staged and then have our undercover operative meet with Tina and show her the pictures. Hey, 
so that we can confirm that you're the person that they want to hurt. Tina makes a payment. She delivers the, the information. We have her on tape. So we had enough evidence, and we indict both Tina and Paul Smith for the conspiracy to try to take out a police officer by getting her arrested, putting her in custody. That kind of created that separation. She realized, I'm not just getting beaten by him. I'm not just getting tortured by him. Now, I can go to prison for a long time because of him. She agreed through her attorney to now speak to us about Paul Smith and the type of person Paul Smith is. He offered her to Blade. He told the Blade, hey, look, I have a girlfriend. She's really, really good at giving sexual favors. And I'm trying to be using term. That's not the term that he used. If you want, um, you know, I'll pay you for taking out this witness. Also, I can get her to do certain things for you. Just offers her up, just like that. And as a jury will soon discover, that's just the beginning. I think they might have met at a orgy. You know, bondage and cutting them up. You have no sympathy for people like that. 22 years after the murder of Robert Haugen, the trial of suspect Paul Smith gets underway in an Orange County courtroom. I got as close as I could to the front and just let him know that, you know what, you're never going to be forgiven for this. And if you ever talk to people and they tell you, yes, when I looked in that person's eyes, all I saw was evil, that's what I saw when I looked in Paul Smith's eyes. I think his demeanor was, I'm going to get away with it. He's smiling. He's looking back at family members, uh, walking into the courtroom thinking, I'm going to get to go home by the time we're done. Didn't make me happy when I saw him happy. I wanted him to be miserable for the rest of his life. The trial lasts less than a week, but the courtroom drama will be remembered for a long time to come. Paul Smith took a stand on his own defense, which is very rare. The more he talked, the more bizarre it got. Group sex, sex with animals. I mean, that's um, one of the more staggering things. You never think you're going to hear that in court. The more it became obvious what kind of person he is. And it was an absolutely amazing to watch the prosecutor, because the prosecutor brought out Paul Smith's anger streak. So we actually had this thing going on. Was, I'll ask a question. He'll talk for about a minute, and then I'll go, are you done? And he goes, yes. I go, then let me ask you the question again. It got to a point where Paul Smith was getting extremely exasperated. And the jury's watching this. Are you done? Are you done? He will talk, 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 and he'll lean forward. He goes, now I'm done. And you see the jurors just go, hmm. I wanted the jury to see what kind of person this is. Court watchers and detectives just shaking their heads, Mike. Why did we just listen to him? After two days of deliberation, the jury returns with a verdict. I was sitting next to Robert mom and with his family and the court clerk read the verdict the jury found paul smith guilty of murder of stabbing robert to death we all stood up and robert haugen's mom gave me a hug and put her hands on my shoulders and said you never need to prove me wrong again paul smith is sentenced to a life behind bars and he's never ever gonna be a free man again so that was a good feeling that was a rewarding feeling. Yvonne Schull and Sergeant Ray received the California Police Officers Award for Best Cold Case Solved. But that doesn't mean they don't still have questions. Unfortunately, we will never know the answer as to why Paul Smith killed Robert. Only Paul Smith knows that answer. Knowing Robert, he would probably forgive Paul. He would have probably forgave Paul. His mom still burns the eternal flame for him, even though Paul Smith is in custody. And she probably always will. And as long as there is a mom somewhere saying, please keep looking at my son's case, please keep looking at my daughter's case, there's going to be an Yvonne, there's going to be a Ray, there's going to be somebody like me who's going to say, we're not going to forget. For more information, go to omca.oprah.com slash murder she solved.